Coming up on today's show. You know, you have a decision to make every morning when you get up and it's you're going to be a positive person or you're going to be a negative person. And are you going to, you know, just survive and get through the day or are you going to look to thrive? Peace be with you. This is Catholic Sports Radio, located at the intersection of your faith life and sports life, and on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, YouTube, and lots and lots of other platforms. I am Bruce Wozniak, talking with Catholic guests who are current or former athletes, coaches, referees, umpires, clergy, administrators, and more from the pro, amateur, and scholastic ranks about the intersection of their faith life and their sports life. The show website is catholicsportsradio.net or .com. They will both get you to the same place. Be sure that you have signed up there for free for the Catholic Sports Radio e-newsletter that gets sent out each Monday. That's it, really, just once a week. While you are there on the website doing that, look to at the top of any page on the site, and you will see social media links, logos for this show, meaning Facebook, X, Instagram, and YouTube so that you can engage with me and the show that way. The Catholic Sports Radio community is the Facebook group consisting of listeners of this show and some past guests. That is free to join, and you can also find a link for that too on catholicsportsradio.net. I love hearing from listeners. I get so excited when I see an email coming in. So social media as well as the website all give you the opportunity to contact me, as does traditional email, which you can do through Bruce at catholicsportsradio.net. Now on to my ministry moment for this episode. There is a reason that an athlete gets chosen as a team captain. A lot of it has to do with being wise, showing good judgment, making good decisions, and setting a good example for their teammates to follow. Coaches usually end up with their position because they demonstrate the same qualities. Additionally, they provide good counsel to their athletes. They prove themselves to be good leaders. And, like a team captain, they set a certain tone, a certain expectation in the locker room. Composure is critical as a captain and as a coach. These are traits we need to demonstrate in our daily lives. As Christians, we are called to that behavior, and we have an opportunity for those who are watching us. It's not getting mad at the person who cut us off in traffic. It's keeping our cool when someone is pushing our buttons. It's showing grace under pressure in business, at home, at the ball field, wherever we have the opportunity to reflect Jesus in us. In the Old Testament, in the book of Daniel, chapter 12, verse 3 says, quote, But those with insight shall shine brightly like the splendor of the firmament, and those who lead the many to justice shall be like the stars forever. Moving on now with this week's episode, my guest was chosen by the Cleveland Cavaliers in the eighth round of the 1983 NBA draft. He has been enshrined in both the Illinois Basketball Coaches Association Hall of Fame and the Great Lakes Valley Conference Hall of Fame. He is the Lewis University men's basketball all-time scoring leader and helped the program to its first conference championship and to their first two NCAA tournament berths. Present day, he is the president of Marist High School, a Catholic institution in Chicago where the Sportsplex was named after him this past December, having been their principal for 22 years and a basketball player back in his days as a student athlete there. Welcome to Catholic Sports Radio, Larry Tucker. Thanks so much, Bruce. Looking forward to the conversation. Likewise, likewise. Thank you, Larry. Folks, almost three months ago, March 18th, episode 268, my guest was Terry Tucker, who, yes, is Larry's brother. I hope you are a regular listener of this show and you're already saying, yes, I remember that interview. But not only can I not pretend that everyone listening to this episode heard and remembers that interview, but it's not fair to Larry if I just skip over some areas because, oh, we probably covered that with Terry. Not to mention that we all have our own story, and in some cases you'll hear in life, not this show. 
two different versions of one story. So Larry, start us off by giving us your memory of the Tucker household from the standpoint of the Catholic faith when you were a young boy. Well, I was uh, born here in the Chicagoland area, and my dad's job changed a few different times. So, Bruce, we moved around uh, a number of times. We went to Atlanta, Georgia. We moved up to Columbus, Ohio. We came back uh, to Chicago, and then we went back to Ohio. So during that time, I would say the thing that didn't waver with my family, and it truly came from my mom and my dad, was our faith life. Prayer was an important part. We went to church on a regular basis every Sunday, holy days as well. My mom would have us say novenas sometimes uh, at home when uh, there was a family member who maybe had an illness or something, and uh, just those values were placed in us. Church was always something we did as a family. It was never you could go on your own type of thing. You know, we had our regular pew and and everything and uh, knew all the people around us, and uh, it's just been ingrained for the 62 years of my life. And managed, despite all those moves, to keep up with First Communion, Confirmation, all the sacraments? Absolutely. Yeah, that was an important part as well. And I should mention, I have an older brother, Terry, that you just mentioned, and a younger brother, Brian. Brian is uh, five years younger than me. So there's three boys growing up, and uh, sports was a big part of our family. And I think faith played a role in that as well. My dad was a coach of ours as we grew up uh, in the grammar school ranks definitely in basketball and football as well. Yeah, tell us about young Larry Tucker, the basketball dreamer. Well, I, you know, everybody gravitates towards something in life, and I think probably I started playing basketball in second grade. Dad was our coach, and I uh, was playing alongside my brother Terry, and uh, we were watching games on TV all the time, the NBA and the Boston Celtics and the glory days and, you know, the L.A. Lakers and I just I dreamt of playing uh, in the NBA and, and being a Division One basketball player as well. And uh, over the course of time, uh, as people dropped their dreams, I just hung on to mine uh, as people would, you know, what, what do you want to be when you grow up? I mean, that answer never wavered. I want to play in the NBA, and I was driven by that. But you said you were born in the Chicago area. You moved to Atlanta and Ohio. So I was waiting for you to say the Chicago Bulls, and you were naming other teams instead. Were the Bulls your team, and you just didn't say them? Or for some reason, did you attach to, say, the Celtics, for example? It was probably the success of the Celtics. That uh, We were living in Columbus, Ohio, when it was probably in my formative years. I was in second grade when I started playing basketball, and uh, they seemed to be on TV, you know, all the time. Um, and they, you know, they were world champions, and there were a few times Dave Collins, you know, their center, you know, became my so-called idol, uh, the person mm. that I patterned my game after. And uh, so, yeah, they, you know, they've always been probably our favorite team. It was great to live in Chicago. Don't get me wrong; I'd have Michael Jordan and the Bulls and their six championships, and that was fun to watch as well. I can't say that I wasn't a Bulls fan, but. Celtics have always been uh, near and dear to our hearts, I think, in the Tucker family. I only briefly alluded to it in the intro, but tell us more about when you were playing basketball in high school, because there's actually a plot twist in that story. Well, there is. It's interesting. Uh, I came to Marist High School as a freshman. My brother, uh, we had just moved from Ohio, so he was coming as a sophomore, Terry being a year older than me. And Terry was six seven soon to grow to be six eight and you know I was a six one basketball player that uh, was just kind of this tag along with my brother Terry got all the attention and and that was fine it kind of took any pressure off of me so to speak and mm. uh, we played you know freshman year I was on the freshman team sophomore year I was elevated to the varsity to play a role and it was unfortunate my brother had knee operations and uh, hip pointers and just various injuries it seemed like every time he turned around his luck was not good and I was always kind of cast in to play, you know, the follow-up to him when he would come out of the game. And, and I started to develop my own game and my own confidence. And uh, it just was something that I really got excited about. In junior year, I started to get on the radar. I had grown to 6'6", and I was on the radar of some uh, Division One basketball scouts. And then at Christmas time, we went to a tournament that uh, is a great tournament, uh, Centralia, Illinois. And uh, Teams from around the Midwest uh, traveled to play in this tournament, very prestigious, a lot of college scouts there. And uh, in my hotel room, there was uh, some of our teammates had brought some alcohol, unbeknownst to me, and it happened to be in the room that I was in. And so then there was a party, and you know what? I stayed, and I drank, and 
we got caught and uh, suddenly I found myself kicked off the basketball team and you know you take your eye off the prize for just a minute and it can kind of change the path of your life and uh, mm. junior year back then this was 1977-78 season junior year was an important year you know you continue to be recruited well I lost the second half of the season and nobody called me nobody wrote me letters and you know so that got to senior year and now I felt all kinds of pressure that I needed to you know, do something if I wanted to go play basketball at the college level. And so that one bad decision on my part cost me a lot. And so you ended up at Lewis University, which was a small D2 college. But as we heard in the intro, you were really thriving on the court. Take us back to that time, but also how prayerful were you or weren't you that maybe, just maybe, the NBA could still come calling? I always heard from people, if you're good enough, they will find you. And it didn't matter what sport, maybe what occupation, whatever, you just kind of keep grinding away. And Lewis was about 45 minutes away from uh, our house here in the Chicagoland area and was a Division II school. So my dream of playing Division I basketball didn't materialize. But I remember thinking I'm going to do the best that I possibly can with the God-given talents I've been given to try and make something of this. I wasted an opportunity when I was in high school, and, and I'm going to try and make the most of it. So I wanted to be part of a winning team, wanted to have an impact on those around me, and I made up for lost ground, and I thought a pretty solid career. I, I, my junior and senior year, I was named uh, Division II All-American. I was the player of the year in the conference my junior year. We had success as a team. My coach would say that he's getting a periodic phone call from team scouts that were asking questions about me. So I thought mm-hmm. there was maybe an outside chance but you never know. And the draft is done so differently today, you know, where everything is televised. There's only, you know, a couple of rounds really. And back then they had 10 rounds and, you know, you, you didn't watch it on TV like you do today. So uh, things just kind of went my way after Lewis. Well, and let's face it, one of my favorite Bible verses is Luke one thirty six: for nothing shall be impossible for God. So even though you're at a small D2 college, you are giving it your all, and you have learned from that lesson of your junior year, and you are keeping your eye on the prize. And so in prayer, you're asking the Lord to look with favor on your basketball career if it's in his plan for you, and you have that faith that with him anything is possible. And so, yeah, as you started to allude to, in this day and age of made-for-TV draft shows, I'm talking about the NFL, the NBA your experience, Larry, was much, much different back in 1983 when there was no social media, there was no internet, there were no cell phones. Share with the audience about your NBA draft experience. Well, I had a lady um, with her assistant show up at my dorm. We ate downstairs and she came into the cafeteria and she said to the brother, I'd like to talk to Larry Tucker. And it turned out to be this Eloise Saperstein, who was my agent and her father, Abe Saperstein, had started the Harlem Globetrotters. So Hmm. I was pretty excited that out of the blue, this woman came in with a pretty good basketball pedigree, I would say, and wanted to represent me with the potential that I might get drafted. So now my hopes got up a little bit and I went home. My parents had moved in the middle of my college years from Chicago to Ohio. So now I go home to Ohio and it's the day of the draft. And, uh, I remember sitting at home, sitting in the family room with my mom and my dad, and I don't know what we were talking about, but I didn't know how this was going to work. I was hopeful, you know, and I remember the phone rang, and uh, it was probably around dinner time, and I got up and was kind of joking around, and I said, that's probably the NBA calling, and (laughs) got on the phone, and it was a reporter from Joliet, Illinois, who covered us at Lewis, and he said, hey, I just saw, you know, through the ticker tape here, so to speak, that you've been drafted. And I could not tell you how excited I was, Bruce, at that time. And he said, Cleveland Cavaliers, uh, looks like they've taken you. And he started asking me questions. He said, I want to write an article. So I can't wait to get off the phone to tell my parents. Mm. Yet, um, as I'm writing this, my mom, you know, is she can see, you know, into the kitchen. And she's like, who is he talking to? And she walks over. And I remember writing on a little piece of paper, Cleveland Cavaliers. Mm. And I remember she took it and she brought it over to my dad. Now, my dad was just diagnosed with cancer. Mm. Big man, stoic, you know, non-emotional, never saw him cry. And I just remember how emotional he was, you know, when my mom showed him that. And uh, it was just an exciting moment in my life. But now I'm waiting for verification. And I called my agent and she had another 
player she was representing uh, was a, a first round draft pick. And um, so she was spending a lot of time with him and understandably so. And when I said, I just got this call, I heard I got drafted and she said, I'm going to have to check. And she checked and she came back and she goes, you're right. Yeah, you did. And wow. so now I knew it was true, but I hadn't heard from Cleveland and it wasn't until the very next day that <laughs> they called me to say, we thought you were in Illinois. We were trying to get a hold of your number. Nobody knew how to get a hold of you. Oh, and my so gosh. A little bit different than how it is today, I think. <laughs> but uh, it was exciting, you know, for me and for our family as well. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And <laughs> very different from the live shows today where you see that student athlete getting the call on his cell phone and the team is right. on the other line at that moment. But still just as joy-filled back then as I know it is today. I know we've had a couple husband-wife guests each on their own episode over the years. And off the top of my head, I'm thinking of one example of sister-brother guests that have been on this show. But still, though, this is pretty unique, getting to hear the brother of a previous guest and his perspective and his story. And Larry has more to share. But now that we're closing in on the midpoint of June, I remember back when I was a kid that living in the Northeast, you cherished summer because you knew that up there it does not last long. And so the priests at our parish oftentimes did not even give a homily at all so as to shorten the mass and let everyone get on with enjoying the outdoors. So I'm going to take a similar approach on this episode as it relates to my usual break to take off my hat as the host of the show and put on my accounting hat to report to you specific expenses of late. As it is, I think I did enough of that over the, I don't know, something like three of the last four or five episodes. So you already know what I'm up against. Quite simply, this is a ministry for me. It's neither my full nor my part-time job, and I don't get any income from doing this, nor do I have any sponsors. So as I've stated plenty of times, I, as a result, am faced with having to try to find some way out of my own pocket to cover all the expenses that go with operating Catholic Sports Radio both on and off the air. So I simply ask, if this show is helping you in your faith life, if you enjoy Catholic Sports Radio, if you see value in the work that I do to keep this ministry going every week for more than five years now, and you believe in the mix of faith and sports and would like to support these ongoing efforts, please prayerfully consider Catholic Sports Radio as part of your tithing. It's quite simple to do. There is a blue Donate to CSR button on the homepage of catholicsportsradio.net or .com. As some listeners and guests who have done it would attest that is fast, easy, and secure. There is no list of amounts to have to choose from. You simply type in whatever amount you're comfortable giving. And by the way, this will allow you to use a credit card, debit card, or even PayPal. Alternatively, as some folks have opted to do, you can get in touch with me about sending a check through the mail Simply contact me through the website or through social media or just email me via bruce at catholicsportsradio.net and I will email you back with the details on sending something that way. Regardless of which method you use, the blue Donate to CSR button on the website or sending me a check, with your permission, I will happily say your name on the air as a public thanks or as some have instructed me to do, you can ask to remain anonymous. I'm grateful for your considering Catholic Sports Radio as part of your tithing as I continue working to move more people closer to Christ through the mix of faith and sports. Larry, after your stint in Cleveland, you actually ended up in a sales career. It might not sound like it, folks, but God was guiding the way. Larry, explain what I mean. Well, it's interesting. I took a job downtown Chicago, and I was selling surge protectors right when the computer business was booming mm. in the 80s. And so I uh, got to travel. Everybody told me what a great job I had. You get to see the country. And I had a lot of friends who were in regular office jobs. And I was making really good money. I mean, the, the sales job was good. I was uh, living in an apartment in Chicago. and But I just hadn't found my passion. And as much as the company was great, the people were great. I'm like, is this what I'm going to do until I retire, you know, sometime, you know, in my 60s or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted to change. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And it's interesting. I had mentioned my dad having cancer. Well, he passed away in 1986 and I'm working downtown. I got the phone call. I obviously drove to Ohio and was there on, you know, his final day and saw him pass and went to the wake, the funeral. I came back to my apartment in Chicago and I think I was depressed. And I think that depression lasted for months. Mm. And when you don't think there's a plan, I mean, God has a plan for you. And I, I just didn't know what it was. And I really stopped going out with my friends. My girlfriend and I had broken up. I, there wasn't a lot that I 
was really looking forward to. I'd go to work, come home, make dinner for myself and go to bed and start it over the next day and wow. travel some in there. And finally, um, I got a phone call one day and it was from the basketball coach at Marist High School, my alma mater, where I had gone. And he had called and he said, you know, we want to come up and play in an open gym against some of the players here. And our seniors and juniors are here. And I thought I had back to Marist in a few years. Yeah, I'll come up. This will be good. It got me out of the house. But when we finished playing, he said to me, what do you think about coaching basketball? Mm -hmm. And a light went on. That was the path. And uh, I said, I think I'd love to teach and coach. If you can get me in here teaching, I'll definitely come. And he did. Mm -hmm. And I, I left and I came to Marist. And that was kind of, you know, a pretty pivotal moment in my life that sent me on a, what I would say is a pretty good career path. Mm -hmm. and, I, and again, I think God just puts people in your paths. Amen. Amazing. Amazing. And folks, I hope you heard me say that while Larry is presently the president of Marist High School, he actually was the principal before this current role. And Larry, you have an amazing story about getting that principal job. Well, it's so funny. I'm a 36-year-old kid, I'll call myself, because I still had been in the world of education at that time for about 11 years. And Never would I dream of, you know, being a principal at Marist High School at my alma mater. It was, uh, it was the largest all-boys school in the state at the time. We've now transitioned over to a co-ed school and still have 1,550 students here. So it's a big school, and I didn't want to be a principal. I thought I'm, I was a dean of students at a rival Catholic school down the street, and I thought this is what I'm going to do. And, and I had started to look for another job because I'm at the time now I'm married and my son is born and my wife is pregnant with my, what turned out to be my first daughter. And I thought I need to make a little bit more money. I started to look at the public schools mm. and uh, interviewed for a position as a Dean of students and was during the same time I was getting phone calls from people over at Marist saying, you should come over and interview for our principal's job. We need a principal. And I'm like, I don't know that I want to be a principal. And even if I'd interviewed, they'll never give me that job. I'm too young. I don't have mm. the experience. But, and so I, threw my head in the ring and I thought, what the heck? And they called me up and came over and interviewed, no pressure. Cause I don't think I'm going to get this job. And I just kind of laid the cards out in front of me. Here I am. This is who I am. If you're interested, so to speak, I thought the interview went pretty well, to be honest. And I got that job offer and I had the Dean's job offer. Now I have to make a decision. And that was, I think the hard part for me is, you know, I, I have a growing family. The Dean's position at the public school would give me the summer off and pay me more money. Mm. So why wouldn't I take that? There was something holding me back in my heart mm. that said, this is your alma mater. Yes, the principal has to work year round. You'll make less money, but this might be a job that you want to do. And uh, so my story is, you know, my mom is in Ohio still. I'm calling her. I'm talking to my wife. I asked both, can I have a couple of days? I'm trying to figure this out. And um, my mom was saying, what do you think? What do you want to do? And I'm like, I'm not sure. And she said, well, your father's going to help you with this decision. Mm. My dad died in 1986. It's now 1998 when this is happening. So he's been gone for 12 years and I just don't know how much I believed what my mom said, but mm. I was like, okay, mom, I hung up the phone. I went to bed that night, Bruce. And I'm telling you, I'm not a big believer in dreams when you sleep. I don't study that or think about that much. But I had a dream that night it is so vivid as if it happened to me last night. And in the dream, I walk into Marist High School and by the main office, and my dad is sitting there on his student's desk, and he's writing in a notebook. And it's kind of like there was an unwritten rule in the dream that, you know, your father's passed, you can't talk to him or whatever. So I didn't try and talk to him, nothing. I just walked up behind him, and I looked over his shoulder, and in the notebook he had written, this is a good place. And I remember waking up and saying, like, oh, my God, like that was... And I remember I talked to my mom the next day and I said, mom, I got to tell you about this dream. And I told her about it and I told her some details. One of the details was down the hallway to my right, there were these large movie projector screens. And, you know, she said, well, that makes sense. And I'm like, what do you mean it makes sense, mom? I don't know why I told you that detail. It had nothing to do with the dream. And she goes, well, when you stand at my dad's grave in Columbus, Ohio, there's a large drive-in movie theater that was off to the right. She oh. reminded me of that. And I was like, oh my God, you're right. And I just felt like my dad was trying to say, this is the job you should take. And I look back on that and I'm also wondering, could it have been my dad saying where I am is a good place? Like I'm in a good place. I'm in a, oh. I wrestled a little bit with, you know, I'm here in heaven. This is a good place where I am. Like, uh, so I, I think he was trying to say to me, take the marriage job and 
I wound up doing that, and that was 26 years ago, and was principal, as you said, for 22 years, and now the president for the last four. Oh, and folks, I got chills, and I also have a cry in my throat. It's just an amazing story. And so those of you that are struggling with business decisions, right, everything that Larry just said is not a basketball story. And those of you that are struggling with business decisions, I hope you're praying about them, and I hope that when people use the expression pray about it, it's not just a figure of speech because clearly that's what his mother in a roundabout way was encouraging him to do through his father, and lo and behold, you heard him say 12 years since his dad had passed away. So this was not something that would have been expected, but again, it goes back to what I said in the first half of the show, that nothing shall be impossible for God. Speaking of being the principal, a very demanding job, You still made time for prayer each day, though. And audience, this, too, is a good tip for those of you searching for where in your schedule you can devote time to prayer. Larry, share with the audience how, or I should say when, you were doing it. Well, it's interesting, Bruce, when you think about it. It was a big job, and I'm 36 years old and very wet behind the ears. And Every day I walked in, there were challenges, and there were things that I had never experienced before. And not horrible things, but just like things that I had to overcome and obviously leadership that I had to provide for scenarios. And it just struck me that I was on the go morning, noon, and night that I did not find time for prayer at the time. And I, it was bothering me. And I said, I'm going to just settle my mind. And it, the easiest thing to do was I'm sitting in the car and I'm driving an hour each way to school. And the morning I spent an hour in prayer and uh, it just calmed me by the time I got to school. Mm. I felt confident. And I just felt like life was really good. And then to get closer as uh, my family grew and we wanted to get closer to Maris so that my own kids could come here. And I said, they'll never have a social life if they're an hour away. We moved closer. But now I cut my commute time in half to a half hour. And I remember thinking, how am I going to say all these prayers? (laughs) I'm very comfortable saying. And I would say the first half, the first 30 minutes as I drove into school and then, you know, on the way home, the next 30 minutes, at the end of the day, I would say the rest of the prayer. So I've still kept to that ritual. It's been part of my life and, you know, not always one to just jump in and let's turn on the radio, so to speak. I just, it was just the calming influence that I needed. Mm. And uh, I think just to put me on a good path to start my day each morning. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. We are blessed to have Larry on and get a front row seat to his story. At Marist High School, they do a Kairos retreat program for their seniors, and he gets to tell his story to them. Larry, I would love it if you could share with the audience what you tell to those students each time you speak at that, because it is really, really powerful. Well, I've had, the again, the luxury. We started the Kairos retreat. We were looking for something, a different type of retreat program, and in 1999, so I'd been there for a year we started it. So it still exists today. Every Wednesday, I go out and give uh, the talk the result of God's friendship. There's been 183 Kairos retreats. I missed two for conferences that I was out of town at. Uh, so I've gone out 181 times. And I really kind of explained some of the things that I talked about here, my life story and, you know, how God puts people in our path. I tell the, the dream story of my dad. And again, how I think God put him in my mind to help me make what been just one of the most important decisions I've I've had in my life in terms of my life work and just really talk to the kids about my prayer life and really about finding your passion and and to try and make an impact on those around you. And that's kind of been, you know, the mantra that, you know, I kind of uh, connect with so much. Uh, You know, you have a decision to make every morning when you get up and it's, you're going to be a positive person or you're going to be a negative person. And are you going to, you know, just survive and get through the day or are you going to look to thrive? So based on the basketball stories and that, it's not, I say, whether you play a sport or not, that's not the important part. The important part is paying attention to what God is doing and, and who God is putting in your life to help you make some of the decisions that you need to make. And you're not alone and that there is a plan. And, you know, talking about my dad's death, and uh, that was one of the hardest things to go through. And then to have my brother diagnosed with cancer at 51, same age that my dad was diagnosed with. And I thought, here we go again. But You know, Terry's path has been extraordinary, unbelievable. And and I just use those examples to tell the kids, like, you know, I I was a kid. I thought my parents are going to live forever. It's not going to happen. And maybe some of those conversations and, you know, just even saying the words I love you and things like that need to be part of the family dynamic if it's not there. 
But there's also a friend named Lisa that you mentioned when you speak at these Kairos retreats. Yeah, it's uh, Lisa's just a, a, an interesting figure in my life. She came into my life for freshman year uh, of college at Lewis, and Lisa had lost her father when she was in seventh grade. He dropped dead of a heart attack. Uh, some years later, when Lisa was in high school, her mom dated a man, and they got married. And you know, Lisa was excited. This is a stepfather for her, and the couple goes away on their uh, honeymoon and comes back. And uh, the day they got back, he sat down to read the newspaper and he dropped dead of a heart attack in the chair that he was sitting in. And I remember Lisa telling me this and I thought, oh my gosh, I, all the things you've been through. And then later on that same year, she's in her dorm room. It's towards the end of the school year and her two brothers, she was from Iowa. Her two brothers drove from Iowa to inform her that her mother had taken her own life. And our heart went out. There's so many of us were friends with her. She was a tennis player and, you know, being a basketball player, some of the athletes, you know, we all kind of hung around together and it was crushing. She wound up marrying my best friend uh, at the time, Billy, and I was the best man at their wedding. And then I get a phone call here. I'm sitting at my desk at Marist and the phone call was that Billy had, uh, now he was in his fifties. This was some years later. He had dropped dead mm. of a massive heart attack. And I thought the thing that strikes me about Lisa is if anybody could be mad and possibly, I know sometimes people turn their anger towards God, Lisa could be one of those people. She is probably the most religious person mm. I know. I think it was her faith that got her through it. She's a daily mass attendee mm. and she's just somebody that I draw strength from. And she's moved now. She lives in Arkansas near her daughter's. And so for the most part, we just communicate via phone, but uh, she's a true inspiration. And to me, I think that's a story, you know, there's a book out there when bad things happen to good people and you know what, you just have to persevere and I think stick to the path of the Lord. And, and again, I think just pay attention to, you know, those people that God is putting in your past to help you get through those tough times as well. Yeah. And folks, remember that Larry is telling us all this in the context of stories that he tells to the seniors as part of the Kairos retreat program, right? And so if they're seniors, they're getting ready to leave a Catholic high school, and in there is the message, don't leave your Catholic faith behind when you graduate from Marist. You're going to see where you're going to need it, and there's a story right there. I think I counted four different people, Larry, that you mentioned in Lisa's life that passed away, and how amazing, as you said, she could have very easily abandon her faith, and instead she's a daily mass attendee and is about as devout in her Catholic faith as can be. So I think that's great testimony, and it's a great lesson for those high school seniors to hear from you. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think that's something that you hope that they take away. As a Catholic school, you know, every school is going to teach you, you know, your, your basic academic background to prepare you for life. I'd like to think at the Catholic schools and definitely at Marist that we wrap that package of skills in with, you know, your faith life. And that is an important component of what we do here at Marist High School. So the opportunities to share things as adults, like, yes, you know, I do pray, you know, yes, you know, my faith has been important to me. Yes. Here's how it's helped, you know, direct the decisions that I've made. Those are important things that kids can hear. So I think that they themselves will have hope because everybody's going to go through those difficult times. And I think to know that there's something to fall back on is an important piece here. No doubt. No doubt. We unfortunately are out of time, but I would love to close by having you tell us about your wife and the time that the two of you have spent in the sacrament of holy matrimony, but also a sports and faith story about your son, Ryan. Sure. Uh, so I knew my wife in college, though we didn't date. She was two years younger than me, and we wound up going to a Lewis University wedding, and we went together as friends, and one thing led to another, and, you know, um, in 1990, we walked down the aisle, and we've been married now coming up on 34 years, mm. and my son, as I mentioned, I have a son, and I now have three daughters as well, so uh, all grown, the youngest is will be turning 21 this year, and uh, my son works here at Marist High School oh. and uh, doing some development work here, but uh, he has a strong faith life. I think they all do. Ryan was lucky enough, he played football and basketball here at Marist, and was a preferred walk-on at the University of Illinois and really loved his experience there, continued to follow his faith. That was important to him. He had a couple of coaches at U of I. One of them was Lovey Smith, who we knew from coaching the Chicago Bears. And 
Ryan had a unique relationship with Lovey Smith. Uh, they would have conversations where Coach Smith would call Ryan into his office and just say to him, uh, Ryan, you just need to tell me, is the Holy Spirit alive in this locker room? Mm. And like, what a question. I remember when he first did it and Ryan came back to his dorm and called me and he said, Dad, this is what Coach Smith asked me today. And I said, well, what'd you say? And he said, of course it is. And then I gave him a number of examples that I had witnessed and seen. Mm. And so it told me a lot about Coach Smith had a strong faith life too. And it's just stayed with my son. Um, he was a fellowship of Christian athletes speaker. He would go and speak in front of large groups of people and, you know, tell his story and, and connect the gospels, you know, with, you know, uh, I think people in their lives, young people in their lives, which I think is a, such an important piece. So, uh, um, he had a great experience though. And, you know, I'm obviously proud of all the kids. No doubt. No doubt. And a great way to end. And, Larry, it's been so great having you on the show. Thank you for making time to be on Catholic Sports Radio, and God bless you and your family. Thank you so much, Bruce. It was really a great opportunity for me to just share some great stories and relive some great memories. My pleasure. My pleasure. And folks, in 280 episodes of this show, we have never done this prayer before. So this time we are going to close with a parent's blessing before a game. You just heard Larry talk all about what a proud dad he is and We hear lots and lots of references that I make to parents. We hear a lot of guests on the show talking about being a parent. And obviously you heard the importance of Larry's mom and dad throughout this conversation. So let's pray this together in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Bless this child, Lord, as he or she enters this competition. Defend him or her against injury and send your spirit to guide him or her in playing his or her best. Strengthen his or her faith in your constant presence with us in both success and failure. Bring the team victory in praise of your glory, now and forever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much for listening. This is Catholic Sports Radio. Find more at catholicsportsradio.net, as well as on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. It is at Cath Sports Radio on all those. C-A-T-H, at Cath Sports Radio. I'm Bruce Wozniak, and remember, it's not whether you win or lose, it's that it's Jesus that you always choose. Mm-hmm.